Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about the winners and the losers from this past weekend and now we got to get into some superlatives and before I start just want to give a shout out to all the people watching live. Always love to see a couple of numbers down there and uh, see that people are watching. It always means the world to me so really really appreciate that but let's get into some superlatives because this is kind of a fun segment that I started last week and I'm very much into it and if you guys are as well I will continue. If you're not then we will find something else to do. No two ways about that but We'll start with the biggest win of the weekend, and this is kind of an interesting category because I don't necessarily want it to be, you know, who beat the highest ranked team, who had the marquee win of the week, all that type of stuff. Just kind of who did the thing that maybe we weren't expecting or maybe they needed something late in the game to get it going, whatever it is. I think it's just whatever you interpret biggest as, that's kind of the way I'm going here. But um, let's talk about Georgia because although, you know, we don't want to talk about the biggest or the top teams this was definitely a huge win. No two ways about that. And I think the biggest thing with me wasn't necessarily what happened on the field. It was what Georgia was dealing going into this game. I think there was a lot of talk about, is this a Georgia team that is like what Kirby Smart has had? Is this, you know, a team that's going to be capable of winning the games the way that they were able to in the past? And especially with Carson Beck not necessarily playing elite football week over week, how are you going to be able to get it all done? And they went to Georgia and just, or went to Texas and just absolutely railroaded them for four quarters. And I think it was one of those statement games where they said, we are still Georgia. You are not getting rid of us that easy. I can promise you that. So it was one of those huge time wins and definitely one of the biggest wins of the weekend. I also want to talk about Iowa State. This was a win that they badly needed because the Big 12 race is one of those that who cannot lose that quote-unquote Big 12 game? Who cannot lose that game that you don't expect to lose, that you're not supposed to lose, but a lot of people in the Big 12 have lost throughout this uh, first part of this season. So whoever can avoid that disaster is probably going to come out on top. And Iowa State did a great job of avoiding a disaster on Saturday. No two ways about that. BYU did the exact same thing. So one of those things that you're going to have to avoid those landmines. And Iowa State barely avoided one on Saturday. Huge win for them. No two ways about that. The winner for me is Illinois. I think this was a little bit of a program-defining win because, obviously, Michigan is not world beaters by any means this year. They are not a team that I necessarily love, and I thought Illinois was—I did pick Michigan to win, to be totally fair, but I do think Illinois is a very capable team. The thing is, they don't usually beat Michigan. They don't usually beat these teams, and I understand that this isn't a normal Michigan team— it does matter, though. It really does matter for a team like Illinois to beat a team like Michigan and say, we can compete with these teams. We can compete with the teams that have been dominating this conference over the last couple of years. And it's a remarkable confidence booster for that program, for that team, and for Britt Bielema that is going into the rest of the season feeling like he not only has a team that can play good football week over week, they can show up in big time moments and win games in different ways. They've been able to win shootouts. They've been able to win a slugfest like they did on Saturday. So a really remarkable team. And I think Saturday was just confirmation of everything that they've been working for and everything they've been building up for. That was the moment where they proved to everyone that they are very much for real. But then moving forward, individual performance of the week was an interesting one because there's ones all over the place. But let's start with the quarterback that just finds his place on here quite a bit this year. But Cam Ward just went to work again, over 303 yards passing, four uh, touchdowns, no picks. He was absolutely incredible and did just about everything he could do to catch up to Ash and Janty in that Heisman race. I still have Janty number one, but at the end of the day, remarkable stuff from Cam Ward this past weekend and just kind of becoming a weekly routine at this point. I also wanted to give a shout out to Jaden Ball, a remarkable performance against a Kentucky defense that is very, very good against the run. We watched a freshman running back go for over 100 yards and five touchdowns in that game. Really, really incredible stuff, and in a moment where they badly needed him. Montreal Johnson was out. They needed someone to step up, and man, did this kid step up. He's going to be remarkable going forward, and whether it's Billy Napier or someone else uh, taking over Florida going forward, they're going to want to keep that guy in town. I can absolutely promise you that. And then you got Jalen Walker. He's the winner. There's no two ways about that. If you watch that Georgia game, you were th- almost immediately you were thinking, who is number 11? And how is he not the number one overall pick in the NFL draft? And frankly, I think he made himself quite a bit of money on Saturday. I think he is a first round pick after Saturday. And frankly, I think he will confirm that throughout the rest of the year. He's one of those guys that I don't know if people remember back, or it's not too long ago, but I don't know if people remember back to Trayvon Walker, the number one overall pick from Georgia a couple of years ago. Uber athletic kid, didn't necessarily have the elite stats that a lot of the other Georgia players had, but was all over the place, was an absolute nightmare to deal with. 
this is the, kind of that type of guy. I don't think he's going to light this uh, world on fire every single week like he did on Saturday. He is going to play really good football, and at any given moment, he can have a game like that. That is what's so special about this kid, and frankly, if he gets beyond the first round, some GM is going to be very mad. I can promise you that. And then we got to go to the statement of the week. Which team got the, we've talked about the biggest win. Which team got the win that they planted their flag, they proved that they are a team that is turning a corner, they are a team that's going to be have to be worried about going forward, what have you. Kansas State is an interesting one here because I think there were a lot of people, you know, Kansas State starts the year really slow. They don't play very good football. They're a little bit all over the place, get dominated at BYU. And then things start to kind of open up. Avery Johnson's arm starts to really get involved in this offense, makes it really, really dangerous. And I think it's one of those teams that you start slow, more than fine in a 12-team playoff era. You just got to be able to finish strong. And as of right now, it looks like Kansas State's revving up, and it's going to be really tough to stop them going forward. And then we got to talk about Indiana. Uh, Obviously, this was a huge, massive win for them because, as I talked about earlier, I think everyone was just waiting for that uh, other shoe to drop. I think they were just waiting for Indiana to remember that they're Indiana and start losing these games. Outright domination over uh, Nebraska and puts them in a position where they're not only a team that can possibly make a CFP run as an at-large bid. If they beat Ohio State, I, I know that's crazy. If they play incredible football on that Saturday and beat Ohio State, this team becomes one of the craziest stories I've seen in quite some time in college football. They would be right on par, probably above what TCU was a couple of years ago. The winner to me is LSU, though, and I think this is one of those moments where it feels like a turning point for this program under Brian Kelly. In 2023, this is a game that they lose. Many Brian Kelly teams lose this game because you're coming off a huge win at home where you had to fight tooth and nail. You got a couple of things to go your way to win that game, and now you go up to a really tough environment, and they dominated them. From From start to finish, from tip to tail, they were all over this team, and it was really, really remarkable to watch, and I think it shows you that You hire the right guys on either side of the ball, they're going to make their difference. And man, has Blake Baker and that defensive staff made a difference on this team. Then we got to get to the loser of the week. I hate to do it, but that's the reality of this segment. We got to get to it, and Bama's got to be one of the biggest. No two ways about that. This was a moment where it felt like Bama could kind of flip the season a little bit. You get that win over Tennessee, it's exactly what Tennessee did, frankly, because they were kind of limping into this one, feeling a little bit nervous about where they were. If they won this one, Bama fans would be right back to feeling like they're national title contenders, getting to the SEC title, all of that stuff would be back on the table. And then they got punched in the mouth. And I think it's one of those that they're just going to have to realize that this was going to be a weird year. And 2025, you can bounce back. That's absolutely great. But this one was really, really tough. Another one has to be Nebraska. This was one of those games where it felt like Nebraska maybe has the ability to turn a corner as a program, maybe has the ability to win that one big game they haven't been able to, and then they just got dominated. Matt Rule, I believe, I I can't remember the exact number, so I don't want to say anything too wrong. He's very bad against ranked teams while at Nebraska, I'll put it that way. And it's one of those things that Nebraska in general has just been bad. I don't know if it's a curse around there. I don't know what it is, but they got stuff to figure out. And a lot of that stuff is really confusing to figure out more than anything else. But the loser is Texas. There's no two ways about that. I think everyone understands that. This is the team that was on top of the world. Everyone's singing their praises. The entire game day crew just going crazy about how good Texas was, and then they got punched in the teeth. No two ways about that, and I think the good thing about this is it's about how you respond. We talked about it earlier. That's all this is about. If they come back out and and beat Vandy by 21, 28 points, no one's going to be talking about this game in two weeks. I can promise you that. So it's a team that obviously lost this week, obviously got punched in the teeth and has to get back up, but unlike a lot of the other teams, including Nebraska, Everything is still very much on the table for this team, so lost the week, but very much can win the next week and just keep it on moving. And then the surprise of the week, one of the bigger surprises to me, and I don't know if it was the same for everyone else, maybe I was a little bit naive on this front, but just how dominant that UGA D-line was against that Texas O-line. This is one of the best O-lines in the country, and I don't necessarily, that Saturday didn't take me off that take, I'll be totally honest. I just think Georgia dominated. I don't think Texas, you know, the offensive line played outright bad. I think there were a number of places that they needed to play better. But you look back at some of the issues that happened. Some were on Quinn. No two ways about that. He has to step up into clean pockets when he has them. A couple of them were just Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann. 
just being better, just having the right play call at the very right moment. And it was one of those things that I knew we were going to get an absolute do- uh, absolute fight. It was going to be incredible to watch these two units go at each other. But I didn't expect to be coming out of this game and the story of the game be the D-line of Georgia dominating the Texas O-line. I expected it to be a little bit more of who made the plays on the outside. You were right about that, Alonzo. The dogs absolutely do rule. But uh, another surprise to me was just the entirety of the uh, Miami-Louisville game. I I don't know if there's anything to be said about that. I mean, the third quarter alone all over the place. I had no earthly idea what was going to happen next. I could not leave my TV because at the end of the day, someone was going to score. That was the way that the game was going. It was absolutely off the walls and I could not get enough of it. It was so much fun to watch and pretty much Miami is just becoming a team that you're going to want to watch them pretty much the rest of the way, regardless of who they're playing, because it's going to be tons of fun to watch. Um, And then finally, I think the biggest one to me was the Big 12 not going crazy. I think there were a number of different places, BYU, Iowa State, and a couple others where it could have gone very much haywire this past weekend. If Colorado lost, that would have been another haywire spot, and everyone just kind of handled their business. Texas Tech was the only one that fell to a team that they probably shouldn't have, and like we talked about earlier, that's one of those Big 12 games. You just lose to Baylor on a weird Saturday, and that might just be the season for Texas Tech. But at the end of the day, it was one of those things that you looked at this week, you felt like the Big 12 could be a little bit more chaotic, and the favorites pretty much won across the board. And then we got to get to the game of the week. The most important one we have on here, I think Iowa State, BYU was really fun, went down to the wire. Georgia, Texas was just weird. So not necessarily the game of the week, but really fun one to watch. No two ways about that. And then the Tennessee-Alabama game was interesting. It was ugly in the first half. I'm not necessarily saying it was very pleasing on the eyes in the first half, but it weirdly developed into this very interesting, tight game, down to the wire type game in the uh, end of it. And I was really into it. It was all over the place. There were defenses just flying around, and although we didn't get all the points on the board that we might have expected, we got all the big moments. We got, you know, the uh, cigar smoke after the game, pulling down the goalpost, although I didn't love it, but I'm not necessarily going to chastise kids for having fun. So at the end of the day, really, really incredible game, and one of those that started really slow, but then developed into just a really, really fun one to watch down the stretch. And then we got Miami-Louisville. No two ways about that. It was all over the place. There was controversy, elite plays, explosives, everything that you wanted in this game. It was awesome. Uh, Cam Ward went absolutely crazy, made a couple of those Cam Ward plays, and Tyler Shuck hit a number of big-time plays down the field. It was so much fun to watch this one, but the winner is New Mexico-Utah State. And I know that sounds crazy, but this one's very, very simple. There were points in this game. The over-under going into this game was set at 78-and-a-half. I don't think I've ever seen anything that high. They scored 95 points in this game. It was 50-45. to It's just absolutely incredible. It's everything that college football is about. It's about missed tackles and broken coverages and a million points and everything being all over the place. This was that game. I absolutely love this New Mexico team. They are so much fun with Devon Dampier running the offense. And it's one of those things that whenever you see one of their over-unders, you're probably gasped because it is absolutely ridiculous how much they can score in a game and how much their defense can give up in a game. It's uh, one of those teams that if you're looking for something to watch late on a Saturday and they're on, tune in because you'll see something just absolutely bonkers. But let's take our third break here. And when we come back, we got to talk about some questions coming out of week eight. I think the biggest one for uh, for me at least is where do, what do we make of that Texas loss? How do we feel about Texas going forward? Are they a team that was flawed from the jump and we just got exposed? Or is it a team that just had a bump in the road and can continue on and be a national title contender? And I'll break it down right after this. <laughs> 